Aloha, everybody. I'm Mark Coleman, and I'm here as the co-host today of this week's episode of Talking Tax. Uh, my co-host, or really the main man here, is Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And um, our special guest today is Lauren C. Hayes. She's a, a, a William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii graduate. And she's uh, currently with the Liberty Justice Center based in Chicago, although she's living in Florida. Um, she's um, a, a graduate also of Indiana University with a business degree. And uh, she's going to help us talk about um, the governor's housing emergency pro proclamation. That's our topic today. It was the topic of Tom's most recent column, which is published in various newspapers around the state and also on the Tax Foundation of Hawaii website. Um, so check that out. But basically, we want to look into, was that a good idea? Uh, he used his emergency powers under the state constitution to declare a housing emergency. And he suspended all kinds of laws. Uh, it it uh, generated a lot of backlash from people who didn't like some of those laws being overturned or suspended. Um, some of those laws and so, actually, this was issued in July, and since then, he has, just like like, like last week, he uh, updated the proclamation. He had been, there had been many lawsuits filed against him, and some of them have really good reasons uh, for, their, for, their, for their arguments. Um, anyway, the, much of it is still in effect. He revised it and got rid of some of those things that people objected to, but there's still a lot of laws that are suspended. So we're going to talk about the whole wisdom of whether this was the right thing to do, uh, whether it'll achieve its goals. Uh, Tom, Tom, you wrote that article. You were kind of questioning whether it was a good thing. Um, since he revised it, have you changed your mind at all about what the status of that situation? Well, let's uh, kind of start with the background. Uh, what is it, what the emergency power statute is, and uh, and where we go from here. Uh, the the emergency power statute we have in Hawaii is, you know, a statutory framework that lets the governor, uh, basically, when an emergency uh, is happening, or when uh, an emergency has happened, uh, you know, the governor has given extraordinary powers to deal with it, um, including suspending uh, all kinds of laws. Uh, at his discretion if they're going to impede the emergency or, or the emergency relief effort. And, uh, you know, we saw that uh, play out uh, during the pandemic because uh, Governor Ige, his predecessor, uh, used the emergency power statute and kind of chained emergency proclamations. I think each one lasts 60 days. Um, but he kept it going uh, through the state of emergency uh, for about a couple of years. And uh, obviously when you do that, you know, there are questions that can be raised about, well, well are you doing the right thing? Are you really, you know, making yourself king? Um, and what, uh, you know, well, why do we have a legislature if, if, if the governor can just sweep all those laws aside uh, and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we're talking today about you know, the current governor and the current uh, so-called state of emergency uh, that was used to justify an emergency proclamation for housing, uh, the creation of a housing czar, uh, which had the ability to sidestep or circumvent, uh, you know, different kinds of processes that are, you know, currently in place that that, that regulate housing. Um, there is, for example, a permitting process. There is a, uh, a process for what happens if you find uh, uh, historic Native Hawaiian artifacts or burial sites. There's a process for uh, historic structures. There is a state uh, land use uh, commission. There are county uh, zoning and permitting bodies all kinds of stuff to get through. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, housing is a big problem here in Hawaii in terms of trying to get you know, get anything built. You have to uh, maneuver through all of this stuff. So 
uh, so the governor basically has issued this emergency proclamation to kind of cut through all this uh, maze, this uh, this labyrinth of uh, laws, regulations, and so forth. Yes, yeah, so and think the question is called red tape, but. There are good article, there are good reasons, I guess, for some of those laws, but anyway. Yeah, well, of course they were. I mean, that that's why they were passed in the first place. Yeah, I, I, theoretically they were good ideas, but in, in in total they they combined to to just create this sludge, you know, that that people have to trod through, taking years to to get anything built if if they can get it done at all. Um, you know that. The, 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 this goes back to me, in my mind, this has something to do with the police powers of the government, supposed the police powers under state laws, you know, and, and as you noted, um, I think in your article that, you know, an emergency in Hawaii under state law is whatever the governor says it is, right? So it doesn't matter, even though, even though in, the, in the proclamation it says to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people, I think that's the essence of state police power. And and just about any law, you can do just about anything if you can say you're apparently if you can say you're protecting the health and safety and welfare of the people. So um, there is no definition. I know there were some people saying, well, this isn't really a, a, an, an emergency, but according to the law, it's up to him, right? So that's a problem, uh, Lauren. What do you think about that broad stroke? Uh, let me go back a little bit here. During the COVID era, the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, which I'm affiliated with, we did put out a report uh, outlining the problems with the state law, and we urged reform, for one thing, to make the, the cutoff point for the emergency 60 days, subject to approval of the legislature if they wanted to extend it. That law didn't get passed. There were some other things that the, that the Institute proposed relating to reforming that law. But um, yeah, Tom's right that... Uh, even before this housing proclamation, uh, the governor, Governor Green, the current governor, had issued a, a homelessness proclamation in which he suspended almost all the same laws. We did a, we did, we started to look into that. We were doing some research on that about all the laws that got suspended, and then he came out with the housing proclamation, which was just way more general, but it was all the same stuff. Um, anyway, it seems to me that this police power is is like. It's pretty broad. I mean, don't you think, Lauren, about that? I do. I think that this is definitely a situation of government overreach. You know, there's several issues going on with the proclamations for housing. You know, the statute you mentioned, um, the HRS 127A, it defines disaster or emergency as basically an occurrence or the Im imminent threat of an occurrence. So, and that occurrence has to be the threat to loss of life or injury to people, loss of property or loss of environment. You know, so it's pretty specific. And traditionally speaking, you know, like you mentioned, most of us think of a hurricane, a tsunami, a wildfire, you know, natural disasters out of our control, not something that has taken decades in the making and is really not an emergency by traditional standards. So I do think this is a situation of government overreach where we have a housing proclamation for a problem that you know, is multifaceted. It's not just about um, the overregulation. There's other aspects to why people can't afford homes in Hawaii other than the permitting, although the permitting is a big problem. Um, the issue with the proclamation itself, uh, it not only... I think is unconstitutional. I think it exceeds the governor's uh, constitutional authority. You know, the governor by Hawaii constitution and our doctrine of separation of powers only allows him to enforce laws, not create laws. And in this proclamation, he not only created an agency, but he promulgated rules for that agency to follow and basically suspended county and state laws uh, so that he could have his own um, agency decide for affordable housing, you know, and at first glance, it appears as though, oh, it might help 
everybody with the permitting. You know, everyone complains uh, from developers and contractors to single family homeowners. You know, they complain about the permitting and there's valid concerns for the time it takes for a permit to get approved in Hawaii. But this proclamation only addresses affordable housing, or at least it purports to only address affordable housing. So it is very interesting. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned that um, this isn't, you know, traditionally what you call an emergency, but uh, there, there really uh, are, are not a whole lot of guardrails around uh, what a traditional emergency is. I mean, uh, if you're saying, for example, that uh, an emergency can't be if it's, uh, you know, months, years or centuries in the making, well, what about uh, what about if astronomers found an asteroid that they predicted it's going to slam into Oahu in three months' time? Uh, certainly, that that disaster was years or millennia or you know uh, you know hundreds of millions of years in the making. We just happened to be at the tail end of it, and uh, uh, and, and we got three months to go. And you, and you say that's not an emergency because of that reason? I mean, not uh, necessarily. So according to the statute, it defines the emergency as an occurrence or the imminent threat of an occurrence. So in that situation, it would be the occurrence uh, or the imminent threat of the asteroid hitting Hawaii in your example, um, where this is something that is, uh, when we talk about housing and the issues behind the permitting, you know, even the Building Beyond Barriers Working Group has admitted that part of the problem is lack of staffing. You know, that's not an overnight problem. 30 to 40 percent of the um, em required employees for the different agencies, they didn't disappear overnight. Um, another problem that isn't being addressed is... Well, you can, you can say the same thing about the wildfires. I mean, because of understaffing, all of these uh, non-native uh, dry brush grew and grew and and became tendril all along the uh, the way from uh, the mountains to Lahaina. Uh, it got ignited by whatever, uh, you know, spread like crazy and, and leveled the town. Uh, Isn't that the arguing that it, in that situation, sounds like it would have been a, a nice thing if the governor had declared an emergency to clear the fields of the tinder before they caught on fire. But of course, they never did that. You know, the, the whole Lahaina thing is just poor land management and bureaucracy to the max. Um, um, but as far as the housing proclamation goes, um, yeah, he suspended laws like, uh, the, 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 I think it's called Chapter 76, that will allow him to, that will allow the government agencies to hire third party reviewers and contract with the private sector. Because right now there's a state Supreme Court decision, the Kona decision, that won't allow counties or the state to hire um, contract workers or privatize anything if it's traditionally, if it's a, something that's traditionally been done by uh, civil service workers, which are all unionized, of course. Um, and then, of course, the, the original law also suspended, like you said, historic preservation, uh, the original proclamation, excuse me and um, environmental impact statements, and even public record laws, which is outrageous. Uh, but they did that during the COVID era too. Um, so Yeah, I mean, th during the COVID era, it, it was even worse in the beginning. Yeah, because made they, us stay they, in they our suspended. Homes. Yeah, our freedom of assembly, our, you know, it was just, uh, that was just outrageous. And so Governor Green, you know, he grew up, he was trained in that environment as the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and even and even during the governor uh, governor Ige's era, he uh, the, he was in charge of an emergency proclamation to create a Kauhale little village for homeless people under emergency proclamation. So I think that's where he got the idea for the homeless emergency proclamation once he became governor that he signed while he was giving his you know his um, his uh, state his inaugural address, as I recall. Uh, but then it turns out he was also working on this this broader housing proclamation and i think the arguments that you know earth justice and i think it was earth justice but anyways sierra club and aclu and all these other groups <clears throat> they were saying first of all this isn't really that kind of an emergency secondly he, he he consulted with like over 200 people over periods of months about this before declaring it an emergency so obviously this is stuff that could have been handled legislatively 
I mean, because that's what legislators do. They get together and talk for months about things like this. And the let and he backed down. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to call it backing down, but he maybe it was he wanted to be Pono and a Hanukako like the grassroots do it. And he went, OK, I'll I'll get I'll I'll restore all those laws, um, at least a lot of them. And, you know, we'll try to make it we'll try to finish. We try to accomplish what we want with what's left. Um, but I, I think, you know, whereas, for example, in the grassroots report, our conclusion was trying to sue over that COVID emergency proclamation was very problematic because the courts tend to favor, they tend to side with the government in the t in, in t times of emergency, a clear emergency, which in the first, you know, shut down for two weeks is what we were told, right? But after it started dragging out, you know, you thought maybe you might have a better chance of winning in court. Um, but we didn't do that um, because the Grassroots Institute didn't sue because of, of the fear of a of possibly a precedent that might make winning such you know that a precedent that might go against the the claim against uh, the emergency proclamation. Um, well, and, and actually, there was a suit that, that that was brought on the Big Island um, by you know some people or other, uh, and it was got in the circuit court level, uh, and and the government won. Uh, you know, yeah. during the during the emergency, the uh, COVID yeah. emergency pro proclamation. Well, they won by being in, in being dismissed, right? I don't think they had a precedent. Well, yeah, I mean, there certainly isn't any appellate case law on it, but yeah. but, so, but the, so, but the so question then right. becomes: Look, I mean, are you I'm, going to argue uh, that uh, you know emergency proclamations or emergency laws are invalid because you had a lot of time to plan them out? Uh, I don't think that's a valid argument because, you know, you want that kind of uh, deliberation if, well, you, if you can. Well, I think you said that in your article, and I think that's a really good point. Uh, but I, 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 what do you think about that, Lauren? Well, well, I understand that, you know, deliberating on a certain emergency ahead of time is important. The things that he's deliberating on really should be taken care of by the legislator, legislature and by the people. You know, this type of issue is not something that should be um, taken over by the governor uh, almost in a dictatorship manner, you know, because what he declares as an emergency today, um, while it seems, you know, good on its face because, you know, everyone in Hawaii or most people in Hawaii will agree, yes, housing is an issue. Yes, permitting is an issue. Um, maybe tomorrow the emergency doesn't, isn't something we agree with. Because it's, you know, another long term thing that's on his agenda, um, you know, so picking and choosing battles um, and, and what, you know, is an emergency outside of the traditional occurrence or imminent threat of an occurrence to loss of life, property and environment. I think we're really opening kind of Pandora's box to what he could potentially be an emergency. You know, we've seen it with a couple other governors across the country recently the New Mexico governor issued an executive order saying, well, guns are an issue. So, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically right. I'm going to suspend the Second Amendment. Right. Uh, and that was very quickly. Yeah. Yes, very recently. Uh, and that was very quickly fought with a lawsuit. Um, I just saw the news the other day that the Colorado governor issued an executive order saying all state agencies will stop, you know, I think, immediately using gas powered lawnmowers, you know. And so where does it how is that an emergency or is that something that can be better um, taken care of with the legislature? And I think that if we start to erode our separation of powers and make judgment calls like, well, it benefits us today, it may not benefit us tomorrow. You know, um, well, and that's, that that's I, I think is a the courts slippery to say, slope. I think. Oh, that's I agree. For the courts to say, and 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 there are standards uh, that the courts can use to say, well, is this emergency or not? Uh, you and there's and there's a process behind it in in 127A. Uh, you know, somebody files for an injunction against uh, uh, enforcement of the emergency powers. You, you convene a three judge court, and then off you go. Uh, but but none of that's happened yet. Well, I'm sensing and, and, that you're you're sympathetic to this executive order, and as we're as am I actually because of what it hoped to achieve. Like Lauren said, I think everyone kind of liked the idea, but when you get into the nuts and bolts and really the rationale behind it, 
then it becomes more problematic. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you're being swayed more by the goal as opposed to the process. Well, yeah, I think the, 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 the end, uh, has a little bit to do with it as well. Uh, I mean, here, uh, you have a, a kind of long running problem uh, that we've had in our government for decades. And, uh, we've given the legislature, you know, tons and tons of years, uh, to do something about it. And, uh, for whatever reason, they couldn't or didn't or, uh, or won't. So, uh, and, and, and relief hasn't happened. Uh, and, and I think if I were to go to the legislature today and I, and I, and I told them, well, you know, you should do X, Y, and Z, uh, somebody's going to ask me, well, where the heck is the evidence to show, to show us that X, Y, and Z works? And, uh, for that reason, I think it's a good idea to, to, you know, once in a while go in, break the system, uh, and then see what drops out, see what's working, see what's not, and then, and you can go to the legislature and say, all right, you know, these are the parts that are broken. These got, these have to be fixed. You know, the land use parts. Okay. The historic preservation parts. Okay. But this permitting, this permitting garbage has to be, has to be dealt with. I think that raises a really great point. You know, the working group that he created really the purpose shouldn't be to determine what projects go forward, but it should be used to determine where the issues are in the process. What is the root cause of you know, the, the delay in permitting, um, the lack of developers, the, the lack of affordable housing, get to the roots of the problem and present those issues to the legislature and say, hey, we have convened state and county officials, we've convened nonprofits and for-profits, you know, get the community's input you know, talk to the construction industry, talk to single family homeowners and find out what's going on. And really, I think that you then take that information to the legislature rather than uh, dictate, well, now that we have found it, we are going to be the sole determining factor of projects going forward. Yeah, I think one of the really cool things about this uh, emergency proclamation and coming from a Democratic governor, uh, even, you know, in, in this really blue state, uh, which loves regulation, tends to love regulation, is that it so clearly identifies so many of the laws that have caused this problem. I mean, the, it, it, as short, even aside from that, it's an emergency proclamation. It's a wonderful blueprint for what of what things need to be changed. And I do think the legislature was has been finally coming around. There have been some tiny steps recently that we never would have seen, you know, years a few years ago. Um, but I do like the idea of that, you know, it's that it was, you know, creating a petri dish, creating a a little like enterprise zone. That's sort of that's sort of he's trying to have an enterprise zone for the whole state, and you know, let's see what happens. But couldn't he have done that? Like, like for example, in the revised emergency proclamation, they exempted Lahaina from any of the changes. So uh, I think that's what it was. So everything there is going to be up to uh, up to the people of Lahaina to decide. Well, 60 days later, that can change too. <laughs> right. That's part of the problem. But that is part of the problem. So, so yeah. you know, you're going to build, you're going to have a housing revival in 60 days? No. So he's going to have to extend it, right? How about 60 days later? No. So here we go right. again. You know, three right. Well, I mean, he, he, he right has previously stuff. announced that he's going to do this for a year. Yeah. And so, yeah, I believe uh, in the rules that even says that anybody that they hire for this working group or uh, any of the agencies, the term won't exceed a year, but I'm sure, you know, just issue another proclamation and, uh, you know, that can change. Yeah, and and at any point, uh, you know, somebody can, you know, bring a suit to invalidate this, which I think is the legitimate way of, of of dealing with it. Well, what do you uh, think? Do you think the court would go along with that, uh, Tom? Do you think that 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 the you know that the legis that the uh, judiciary here would side with the governor and say no? It's, it's well, I, I think I think Lauren's right up to a point. I mean, I think uh, she she had mentioned initially uh, that. At least during the first, you know, few days, weeks, months of the, of the uh, supposed emergency, the courts would probably be willing to give uh, the governor uh, a lot of latitude. 
but as as time wore on, I think their patience would be limited, and right. I think that's that's kind of the correct result. I do think there's one argument out there that I haven't seen presented yet in the lawsuit uh, that has some merit. So the governor's basically policy and procedure or practice has been to issue these recurring emergency orders every 60 days. And the statute, I think, is pretty clear that it says that you, the emergency proclamation will terminate at 60 days or by separate proclamation, whichever occurs first. You know, and standard uh, statutory interpretation requires that you read the clauses that, you know, um, are conditioned upon each other and whichever occurs first. I think the interpretation is that, you know, if there was a, an emergency proclamation, he has 60 days. Um, and if for some reason the emergency ends at 45, he can issue a separate one and then it ends at 45. By the same token, uh, if the emergency still exists on day 49, uh, he can issue a proclamation on day 49 saying the emergency still exists and, and I'm going to restate everything that was in the first proclamation and, and, and proclamation number two has 60 days. Uh, which is what Governor Ige did. Right. In which case, I think that that violates the non-delegation doctrine and the separation of powers, and we run into a serious constitutional issue. And I don't think the courts um, in Hawaii have yet specifically grappled with that. I don't think that anybody's brought that forth just yet. Yeah, it, it occurred to me, too, uh, when, when I was talking about um, the lawsuits that prompted the governor to, to revise his emergency proclamation. Uh, you know, when I saw the content of the, when I saw the arguments that they were putting forth, I, I thought, wow, these are really good arguments. This is going to be a tough one if it goes to court. And I, and I wondered if, if maybe Governor Green, you know, thought, well, maybe I'd better back out unless, because if I don't, or, you know, change course, um, not only would he make all the progressive uh, people happy. They were the ones basically pushing the uh, lawsuits, but uh, and he's a progressive, so he wants to make them happy. But also, he might have been a fairy of a precedent that could uh, lock him in in the future to you know less broad, broad-based uh, proclamations. Do you think that could have been a factor? At some point, precedent's got to be made, and uh, uh, I think during the early part of a. Uh, a, a declared emergency is the easiest easiest time for the state to get in there and, and reaffirm that the power exists. So, if, so if I were the AG, I would want the the, the challenge to be made now, uh, in the early stages of the so called emergency, and 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 you know have have the courts rule. Yeah, I can't speak for her, you know the rationale behind um, walking back some of the you know, emergency proclamations and the laws that were suspended. But I mean, I do think that a consideration might be, you know, precedent creating law that says, you know, this type of situation is not an emergency under the statute, you know, so that could prevent him from doing, you know, kind of what I mentioned before, that this Pandora's box of, oh, well, anything can be an emergency, even though the housing crisis has been in place for decades. Well, let's just hope that in general, um, some good comes out of this in terms of the blueprint that the emergency proclamation provides um, for the legislature to pick up on and run with. There's a lot of good things in there that that need to be changed that are, you know that are the guideposts for for change. And um, Tom, yeah, and I do think this is a and in, in at, at bottom, it's a grand experiment, uh, and I'm all for. Uh, you know, proper experimentation. Yeah, I, I commend the governor for the. It's it's actually bold and, I, it, it to, you know, to some extent, too bad you, he can't be a dictator in this kind of a situation. Although, um, again, if you look into the particulars, setting up that body which gets to approve which projects, you know, can be uh, authorized and all of this, I I think it really it it's inter even within itself, it's got too much red tape going on there. Um, so that's ironic, uh, but the, but the sentiment is proper. Lauren, I, th I think you raise um, an interesting point. If you watch the last Building Beyond Barriers working group, uh, I believe is August 29th in their meeting. You know the projects that have been presented so far, and of course it's in only its early days. 
they were all government projects for affordable housing. And the irony is that they are government agencies asking the same government agencies for permission to do their project. So why couldn't they have gotten it done before under the laws that were in place? You know, so it wasn't that there was uh, private parties, um, private developers. These aren't individual homeowners asking, you know, to rebuild their home or remodel their home or add on. Uh, this is government agencies asking the very same government agencies that have created that bureaucracy. So it's an interesting dynamic. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lauren. It's really been great having you. Um, sorry, you thank you. Person in Hawaii, I'm sure you'd like to come back for vacation sometime. Um, Absolutely. Right on. Tom, last word. Well, uh, like I said, this is a grand experiment, um, and I, I do commend the governor for, you know, teeing it up and taking a swing. Uh, I think we we need more bold moves like this to really expose what's what's uh, what's wrong in the in the system that we now have, you know, break it and then tr and try to put it back together better. Right on. Thank you very much, Tom, Lauren. Our listeners today, our, our viewers, thank you for being here today. We'll see you next time. Aloha on Talking Tax here on Think Tech Hawaii.